Hi, welcome to Geo for Good Lightning Talk Series Round 2 on Community Mapping. My name is Devra. I'm a program manager on the Google Earth Outreach team, and I'm going to be your host for today. Last month, we kicked off a series of monthly lightning talks by and for nonprofits, scientists, and other change makers who want to leverage mapping tools and technology for positive impact in the world. We hope these talks inspire you to think of new ways you can have an impact with Google's tools or provide operational or practical hints to improve and optimize your workflows. Please join me in welcoming this month's speakers who are here to share their community mapping projects with us today. Yay, welcome everybody. Hi, everyone. Hi. OK, so before we start, I would like to call your attention to two things. First is the Q&A feature. You can write your question in the Q&A section below the video on this page. If you'd like to ask a question to a specific speaker, please mention their name along with your question. Once all the talks end, we will ask your questions to the speakers live. So please, please stick around till the end. Um, OK, and the second thing is uh, the link to the presenter slides. So on the bottom right of the page, there is a resource section where you can find speaker slides and follow along with their presentations as they walk you through them. All right, so let's begin. Um, our first speaker for today is Saurabh Dhakal. Saurabh is a storyteller promoting stories of people, places, and products using innovative digital platforms at StoryCycle. He's also currently working on two more initiatives, Green Growth to promote local food and organic farming via technology, and Our Dream City to design sustainable and smart communities by using mapping technology, which he is here um, today to tell us more about. Over to you, Saurabh. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Saurabh. Uh, I work for StoryCycle. Uh, I'm based in Nepal right now uh, and the capital city of Kathmandu. Uh, as all you know that the world is urbanizing rapidly, by 2050, over 6 billion people will live in cities and city people will increasingly feel the effects of climate and its impact. In the meantime, cities around the world are looking for the integrated and nature-based solutions to create resilient and a uh, livable city after this uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, on this context, we come up with the idea of designing sustainable and democratic city by using community mapping and storytelling tools, where we work with the young people in different stages. Uh, the stage one, uh, in the first stage, we do a map up camp to collect information about the major landmarks festival, institution, historical points, and other important map points to make digital profile of the community using Google Map, Google My Map, and recently we also started using Google Earth. And the second, we do a dream camp, the local communities, youths, and community le leaders together access what the place was like 10 years earlier and what they want to be a place look like after 10 years. So we captured these aspirations in video format and layered it on the same map. Third, we also do a story camp to build the capacity of the local youth uh, to capture the story of um, uh, important uh, places, history, different personality, and also bring back those stories uh, and put it in the same map that we prepare as a map of camp. And lastly, uh, we organize a build camp in collaboration with the city office to showcase them the all the information we capture, all the map points we capture, and all the aspirations we, we capture on three different camps and plan uh, the city. Uh, we try to plan the city as uh, the young people has their aspirations to be look like. So this is an evolving process. We uh, work in the different cities and communities under this and we call it as a dream city campaign. Uh, uh, this is the uh, one of the demo that we, uh, uh, one of the locations we work in uh, um, uh, Rishing, uh, one of the mountain villages. Before that, we have, a, um, uh, we work and we learn a lot of things from the uh, Google Auth outreach while we were working in Everest in 2014. So, um, and now we are working in different cities. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful talk, Saurav. Um, so I had a question for you. Um, what do you think is the most important 
thing to keep in mind um, when thinking of scaling or replicating Gene City uh, in more countries and in more cities as well. Um, at this time, uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon right now that the uh, after this COVID pandemic, uh, young people are um, very excited to leave their small town or the community and they're happy to work over there. Uh, so at, the, at, at this moment, we need to be identify uh, what are the opportunities and resources around the community. And we, we already have a basic tools and technique that is mapping and storytelling that we can use uh, to, to make uh, small places as a dream city. But the major challenges uh, or major things we need to be identify that the young people is always want to be connected with the world. So the access to internet is a very important aspect for the people who want to use this kind of tools and technique. Uh, that is one thing. And the second uh, subjective, very important thing is the governing system, the political wills, the uh, city uh, elected body needs to be understand that the engaging young people on this whole designing process on the city need to be more transparent, more participatory. So theoretically, many democratic cities or the country uh, always say that, that they are open, but they are practically, they are not open to hope this kind of idea. So um, these two things is very important, important aspect to scale it uh, to around the world. And I, I'm very hopeful uh, after this pandemic that this tool and technique can be replicable to make a city. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Saurav. I'm sure um, a lot of our viewers watching can use the lessons that you've shared in uh, their projects um, around the world. So thank you so much for sharing this with us. Um, OK, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Nosi Seko Untati. Uh, uh, Nosi Seko is a catchment coordinator for a government uh, funded Sitsa project based at Rhodes University that is working with communities in the Sitsa River catchment and Maclear. Um, her personal and professional interests include working with communities, upscaling people, stakeholder engagement and management of relationships, as well as creating and maintaining good communication lines. She was born in the rural areas of the former Trans K in Willowville, Eastern Cape, South Africa. And this makes it really easy for her to engage with communities that she has worked with. Um, all right, so then let's do this. Let's hear from Nursi Seiko. Hi everyone, my name is Nosse Gumtati and I will be presenting on participatory mapping that we did for the CITA project in uh, South Africa. Um, so a lot of development projects have failed largely because they do not take into account the needs of the local people, all the people that are in the space that they will be developing. And in the CITA project, we try to change that by um, including the community members in whatever we'll be doing in their landscape um, by using Google Earth Pro to try and get their um, community voice into it. And this would, community voice would help towards um, the rehabilitation plans and prioritization that would be done by the government. And it would also <clears throat> hopefully initiate some bottom up approach instead of a top down approach that happens a lot in our country. So we planned this workshop with the senior traditional leaders who went ahead and invited their um, subordinates, so that like, uh, sub headmen and, uh, and their headmen. And we, they would organize a venue for us and then we would just arrive and we would present the purpose of the workshop. and. Um, what we expect as outcomes from that. And then we'll go ahead and map the priorities uh, with the communities uh, in, in, in attendance. And for this, we needed uh, our laptops and our projector and pre-printed -pre maps, sticky notes, and just simple stuff, nothing major. Um, and this would include valley erosion, alien invasion, um, vegetation springs that need attention and so much more. This is not just limited to that, it's a few examples. So a general setup looked like this with us explaining the purpose of the workshop or to the communities before everything started. And then would have the communities orientating themselves around um, Google Earth and how it works and how we can see where they, they are and the landscape where they're from. On the left, you see a senior traditional leader who's taken over our mapping. Um, and which was cool because then we could sit back and relax. On the left, you see the map that we would use for that traditional council and the different sticky notes would represent the different groups that were there and how they're prioritizing. The center would be the NRM issue that they are prioritizing 
according to whatever they discussed in their groups. And then this is what would be put up as an um, as outcomes per group, as group one, two, three, four in this case, and they can see um, which are um, interim issues that they prioritize in their, in their group. Um, and then again on the left, it's just uh, showing you the map that we had in the field. And then on the right would be the final product that would have been um, produced via GIS when we went back to the office, which would then be given to the government, which is Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. Um, to use in their planning, which they usually give over to the implementers who and implement in the in the in the areas. Um, also given back to the traditional leaders for them to keep and for them to just see all that they prioritize in the areas and hopefully be able to use it in case they ever needed to ask for funding from the government or otherwise other NGOs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy Seiko. Um, so I had a question for you. Um, and you mentioned that uh, the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment was um, one of the main partners on the project. Could you tell us a little more about some of the actions that the department was able to take due to the community maps that you created and also um, what was the impact of this exercise on the community? Um, thank you. So um the way that the, the government was working way before we arrived is that they have implementers that um look at this nrm problems in the communities and they would come up with ideas of what to implement and where according to their own prioritization so with our mapping that came in um with the community's input whatever the government planned to do in the areas it was um it started from the community's input and um so, and then added on top of what they would otherwise do to be implementing in those areas. Um, so I think it also started the, I don't know, the strength for the community. So they sort of believe in themselves that they can have a say in what's happening in their areas and know and understand exactly who's coming in and what they're gonna do in that space. And yeah, so I think that has helped. And with the implementers, they are also, because they're not part of us, the project, they also informed that whatever they're going to do, even though they still have our community mapping, they still have to go to the communities first, confirm that this is what they want to be done in the area, whether it, it's alien clearing or gully rehabilitation, and they still have to confirm the sites that they prioritized. So in that way, the communities is included and they're happy in participating in what's happening. Yeah, that is wonderful. Um, and one more thing um, I would love to learn is what were some of your most important lessons from this exercise? Most important lessons? Um, I think it's within communities are the same because you know you walk into a rural area, they all sort of look the same from the outside, but actually each community has um, differences from their governance structures and how effective they are. Um, but also they have different challenges within something that you'll never understand from just looking. So, um, yeah, communities are just complex um, structures, if you want to look at it. And it uh, it was, I was, I enjoyed being able to navigate that with the communities and uh, because I was still young in, in this space and it sort of taught me that you're just open and you're, you're flexible you're reflexive and you should be able to change the way you want to do things if you're going to go and work with communities. So that was the most important thing. And obviously improving my Google Earth tools because I just learned how to, to work on Google Earth like <laughs> earlier in that year. So there was a, a challenge and exciting times for us. So it was your uh, first time using these tools on yeah. the ground for a real cause. That is so yeah. exciting. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Nasa Seiko. We'll bring you thank back you. if there are more audience questions at the end. Thank you. All right. Great. Um, so our next speaker for today is Jack Baker. Jack is an intern supporting the socioeconomic team at the Firelight Group. He grew up on Vancouver Island, Canada, and in 2020 completed his MA in Cultural Anthropology at the University of Victoria. His collaborative research combines methodologies from anthropology and geography, exploring the cultural dimensions of pyropia, uh, which is a culturally important seaweed in the Salish Sea, um, and mapping the contemporary co concerns that part partner Halkuminum communities have 
about this seaweed. Uh, Google Earth Engine was mainly used to process and classify high resolution drone imagery of culturally important beaches as part of this mapping effort. Um, in his spare time, Jack enjoys long distance hiking and rock climbing. Okay, let's jump in to hear Jack's talk. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be sharing my research project, Caring for Slakas. This is a collaborative project I had the privilege of working on with my Halkomenum partners on southeastern Vancouver Island. This project seeks to understand a culturally important seaweed called Slakas by Halkomenum speakers and use Google Earth Engine to map Slakas on beaches. Slakas is a small, tasty and nutritious seaweed that grows in the rocky intertidal zones of the Pacific. When it blooms in the spring and summer, it forms large mats on the beach. The relationship between people and slakas is very old, likely the first people living along what archaeologists call the coastal migration route over 10,000 years ago were consuming slakas. Over time, the seaweed has become intertwined with the people living in the Pacific Northwest. I heard slakas interwoven into oral histories, stories about place, and in Halkomenum food systems, teachings, governance, and ways of life. The research questions of this project were guided by and stem from Halkomenum people. Today, Halkomenum people have concerns about the status of their marine foods in their territory, including fluckus. For over 10 years, Halkomenum elders and knowledgeable people have been drawing attention to the seaweed in federal co-management meetings as a species of special concern, yet there have been no dedicated studies to fluckus in the Salish Sea. There is a desire to document the importance of fluckus and to collect baseline information to understand how Fluckus is changing. To conduct this research, two streams of inquiry were taken. An ethnographic approach was used to understand and contextualize Fluckus and the whole communum concerns around um, contamination, marine shipping, climate change, access, and rights. Key to the ethnographic understanding was the concept of caring for the beaches, or in whole communum, Hulelamatsatsisu, the practice of care drives the management of fluckus beaches. One example of this is the construction of rock walls or clam gardens. The one I'm showing here is almost a kilometer long and millennia old. These structures enhance fluckus, clams, crabs, octopus, sea cucumber, and many other Hulkaminum foods by expanding the areas they can grow and otherwise enhancing the habitat. To build a set of baseline information about fluckus in response to the concerns about impacts of marine shipping and climate change in the Salish Sea, we employed high resolution UAV mapping paired with the dual processing power of Google Earth Engine. We mapped a kilometer long section of beach at a resolution of two centimeters while concurrently collecting reference points on what was growing on the beaches. The imagery was loaded into Google Earth Engine and classified the overall classification was accuracy was between 86 and 89 percent. This type of mapping can be applied to monitor flocus and protect Halkomenum rights connected to harvesting and having relationship with the seed. Thanks for uh, listening to my project. Thank you so much, Jack, and we're so glad you could make it um, today. So I am personally very, very curious to know um, if and how you shared the learning from your project back with the Halkomenum community and what their response was to your findings. Sure, yeah. Um, thanks, Deja. Uh, so the partners I was working with have um, co-management relationships with uh, Parks Canada. So the, the, the maps that we created together were then used in their co-management um, um, conversations with the federal government to understand and pri reprioritize how they were um, taking care of the beaches and 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 where um, effort should be sort of focused in, in terms of remediation and restoration. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you. Um, awesome. Okay, so now um, we'll move on to our next talk. Um, we have Stephanie. Stephanie is the Education Projects Manager as well as the Roots and Shoots m and &E Manager at the Joint Jane Goodall Institute. She has over a decade of experience working with youth and educators in the United States and Sub-Saharan Africa. At GJI, she works with the Jane Goodall Roots and Shoots program to empower young people to make positive change in their communities. A critical part of the Roots and Shoots model is step two, 
observe, which includes community mapping as a way for youth to identify areas of improvement in their communities. Let's find out more about the importance of community mapping for youth from Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Keller, the Education Projects Manager at the Jane Goodall Institute. And I wanna share a little bit about our community mapping program. So we um, wanted to help young people and educators and adults uh, who mentor and work with young people plan and identify projects in their communities that have a meaningful impact. And so we took our land use planning tools that we use um, in Africa and developed a set of community mapping tools um, that educators and young people can use. And so I wanna share a couple of quick examples of how these tools are being used. So these are the Garden Gorillas in Bushwick, Brooklyn, New York. And they started their Roots and Shoots project knowing that they wanted to plant a garden, but that they were in a really urban area. There wasn't a lot of green space and they just weren't sure that there was anywhere they could plant a garden. So they used community mapping to identify the places in their community that they could plant a garden, um, where they might face some challenges, and also where they could find some resources to help them. And they also put their personal perspective into the map, which I love. You know, For example, they named this tree Edward, and they did this in a couple of places. Um, they ended up finding a community garden that they could use that had been neglected and was full of old furniture and trash. But they were able to work with the community um, and turn this into a beautiful space and resource for them to use in the classroom and as well for the community to use. Another example is this educator who decided he wanted to have a more individual perspective. And so he took the tool working with older students and turned it into something where they created their own individual maps and their own individual reflections of the community before they came together to decide on an action project they could take as a group. And this last example is a young person who knew they wanted to do a fundraising project around some art and knew that they wanted to do something that helped with United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but that they wanted to have a local impact. And so they used community mapping to identify local community organizations that um, would benefit the sustainable development goals where they could take the funds raised and donate them to these local organizations for that local impact. Thank you. What an impactful project. Thank you so much for sharing it with us, Daphne. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so I, um, you know, Stephanie, you have years of experience working with youth on community projects. So um, my question to you would be, how easy would you say it was for the youth working on this project and, you know, and also on other projects you worked on to start creating their own maps? Okay, I think Stephanie's internet connection froze. Stephanie, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. You disappeared too, but you're back now. Yes, okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, again. Okay. Um, would you like me to repeat the question or did you catch it? Um, I, think I, get, I, think you, I think I got the gist of it. You were asking about okay. how easy it is for youth to start mapping. Is that the gist of it? Yeah, that? yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's actually really easy. I think it's almost easier for youth than it is for adults. Um, just a one of the tools we use the most is my maps, and that's just a really easy tool for anyone to start using. Um, and I think too, youth, ju just like us, they're really interested in like finding their house on a map. They're interested in finding the places that they love on a map and putting their own personal stamp on it versus just like reading a map that exists. Um, so I found it generally is pretty easy to get youth excited about it. And I think what's also really important is it gives them the agency and the expertise then in their community. So they can go back and say like, no, I mapped this. I looked at it. I can see the issues now. And here's the proof. Um, and I think that's really important for youth too. Yeah. So you're not just helping create map makers, mm -hmm. but also creators, owners, and change makers. Exactly. Um, that is so inspiring. Um, and for other organizations who are working with um, youth, are there any tips that you could share if they if they want to introduce community mapping in their programs? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's an easy thing to start to plug into anything. Um, I think the best way to do it is to look at your audience and how, how can you frame it for them? So for us, you know, we started this working mostly with an educator audience. So framing it in terms of like, how could they include this in their lesson plans and make it relevant? Um, so if they have curricular goals, how can mapping help meet those curricular goals and not be an extra, you know, addition for them? And I think working with youth, it's the same if your audience is mostly youth, you know, explaining like how this is going to help them inform a project they might want to do, or how is this going to help inform their decision making? Um, so they know why. I think the why is really important. Absolutely. There needs to be a right purpose exactly. driving everything you do. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Stephanie. Okay, so now we have our fifth talk for today. Um, our next speaker is Matsuri. Matsuri is a second year student at Aiko High School who loves nature. Her special skill is not to miss any small creature in the surroundings as if she has a biological detector. In March 2020, uh, Matsuri school closed due to COVID-19 and the class decided to work on a restaurant support project, which she is here to tell us more about. Let's give it up for Matsuri. Hello everyone, I'm Matsuri Tamura. I'd like to thank you for giving me a chance to speak here today. Let's begin. This is the Matsuyama Take Art Club of the Project Facebook group. We have created a Take Art Shop map for this site. Our goal is to make it easier to find Take Art information lo with lo location information from restaurants. We made information easier to find and improved user experience. We wanted to attract customers to restaurants and increase the number of repeaters. If we can help the restaurants, if we also lead the revitalization of the local economy. Next, let's look at the key points of map creation. One, layering. Two, required information. 3. Subdivided category icons. I designed original icons for the categories. I had the most fun when I was making these icons. There are three tools that I used. The first one is Google My Maps. This is the main tool. The second is Google Jamboard. We all shared about our opinions online to build our ideas. The third is Google Sheets. It was used to enter information, to-do list, discussions, and just to assist in the creation of the map. This gave us a quick overview of our progress. This time, I was on vacation and worked completely remotely. Most of the work was done through text communication, which made the process more efficient. Now let's use the map. Let's take out sushi for lunch. First, take lunch and sushi. Then choose the restaurant and get the information you need for takeout. That's it. At the time, this map was the only map that, the, that was dedicated to take out information, even including professional sites. It helped many users and restaurants. Evaluation. Here is the number of times the map was displayed from June to July. We were featured on Google Japan Social here. The icons were rated as fun. The number of times the map is shown is gradually increasing. The average number of weekday views and the number of weekend views are higher. This is the data of the crowd near Matsuyama Station. Since the second week on Saturday, the number of visitors has been increasing, especially on weekends. If we assume that the movement of people is connected to economic activity, then the number of times the map is displayed tends to be the same as the movement of people. 
This means that the map was able to provide useful content to the users and was able to contribute to the restaurants. As the last item on the project to do list, I received these words of praise from the initiator. With the corona disaster, takeout culture has joined the economy in Japan. By creating my map, we were able to contribute to the to the revitalization of the local economy in a small way. We are very happy to have the opportunity to present our work in this way. In the future, it will be important to have the ability to respond flexibly and quickly to changes in society. And I will continue to broaden my horizons and, the, and expand my world. Thank you very much for kind attention. <laughs> wow, um, what an impactful project. And just by a high school student, um, it really goes to show that anybody um, can get involved with community mapping. Um, and, you know, we'd love to hear from you as well um, on how you are using mapping within your organization. Um, unfortunately, Matsuri couldn't make it here today since she is a student in Japan and the time of the broadcast would be really late at night for her. If you have any questions for Matsuri, please email her teacher. Uh, you can find his contact info in the slides um, that are posted in the resources section. Uh, our next presenter um, for today, and he's our last talk for today, who was also not able to make it for the live stream since he had a conflicting session. If you have any questions for Brian, please email him on his ID, which you can also find in the presenter slides. A quick reminder to all our viewers that after Brian's talk, we will have all our presenters back on the screen and we will be they will be available to answer your questions from the question box. So please do remember to post your questions. Uh, if you haven't already, please go ahead and use the box below the page to add a question for speakers. Um, wonderful. So now we're down to our final talk for the day, uh, which is by Brian Thom. Brian has worked on issues related to indigenous land rights and cultures over the past 30 years. In 2010, he founded UX Eth Ethnographic Mapping Map as a place for indigenous communities to collaborate with university-based researchers and students on mapping projects relating to their cultural landscapes. Let's hear about his project from Brian. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Tom, and I'm an associate professor in the anthropology department at the University of Victoria in beautiful Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about a project that we did to indigenize municipal land use planning in Cordova Bay, the community I live in here uh, in the Victoria area. Uh, Cordova Bay is uh, an incredible spot. Um, it's the site of uh, the ancient village of Tselich, which is where the South Saanich Treaty of 1852 was signed and is in the territories of the Saanich and Lekwungen peoples um, who live nearby today. Although through um, various historical circumstances, there was never any um, reserve lands or lands uh, set aside or recognized in the in the Tzalich area, in spite of what the treaty said. And um, so this has uh, caused a, um, uh, a new course of work for us to do in terms of recognizing those uh, Indigenous people's relationships to our community and uh, and seeing what they, those connections to land can look like in the future. Uh, about four years ago, the municipality started to revitalize their local area plan, which is a crucial uh, land use planning tool municipalities use to uh, to sort out things like uh, land use and uh, transportation, parks and recreation and so on. And nowhere in this plan uh, in the past has there ever been any recognition of indigenous values the important things that uh, Indigenous peoples hold uh, dear and, um, and, and would have uh, taken into account in, in their visions of how the futures of the communities and their territories would go. And as a consequence of, uh, of that lack of recognition in the past, there have been uh, innumerable uh, conflicts and desecrations uh, that have happened in our community, including these uh, gruesome removals of burials uh, that have carried on even as recently as a month ago, 
um, where developers are are are, are uh, um, hitting these kinds of sites, but also changing the the cultural landscapes uh, of, of of important places that uh, that are really valued to the to the community. So our work was to go and create a map in Google Earth that we could share with planners and. Um, um, by bringing in information from the archives, uh, from oral histories and uh, ethnographic sources, we were able to map out an extensive series of relationships of indigenous peoples, um, values and, uh, and sites within Cordova Bay. These became the center of a discussion between the indigenous and municipal leadership uh, last year. And today we have a new plan that is uh, full of information about Indigenous peoples and their values and their visions for the future for our community. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me today. I really regret not being there in person. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can Google my name, Brian Tom, at uh, the University of Victoria, uh, or contact me through btom at uvic.ca. Thank you, everyone. We really missed uh... Brian, but thank you so much for the wonderful talk and thank you to all of you for the great talks. Um, now we're gonna dive into questions from the audience. So are you all excited and ready to answer questions? Yes. Okay, Go ahead. okay. so um, our first question is for all of you. Um, it's um, an open question. Um, what made you select Google Earth Engine as a, or Google Earth as a tool for your projects. Um, thank you for all the insightful talks. Hope everyone is keeping safe. Um, Stephanie, do you want to begin? I see you yes, first. Yes, um, sure. So we, we first started with Google My Maps because we wanted something that was easy for people to use. Um, and especially working with educators and young people, we didn't want to start too complex. And my maps, the learning curve is, is so easy on that. Um, that made it a great entry point. We do also use um, Street View some and Google Earth. Um, both of those are more like visual additions to everything. So my maps is the core, but that was why it was just the easy, easy aspect of it. Um, and I think a counter question um, to you, Jack, since you used Earth Engine, um, yeah, could you tell us a little more about uh, why you chose Earth Engine for your project? Sure. Um, I think we landed on Earth Engine just because of it sort of, you know, it's super powerful, but it's also quite accessible for me, who's not really an expert at remote sensing or anything to sort of get something up and running that can be really impactful for the community I was working with. Wonderful. And um, Nosiseko, this was your first time um, using the tool on the ground. So yeah, how was your experience and what made you choose Google Earth? Um, yeah, so we chose Google Earth Pro because I think um, it's easy to use um, and it's very interactive. So when you're trying to orientate people that have never used Google Earth before, um, you can just let them know, like if you press the mouse like this, then you end up in a certain place as a result. Because uh, it's difficult when you use a, a flat printed map when you're trying to get people to point where their house is, where important spring is, or whatever important natural resource you want to point it. Whereas if it's Google Earth, then it's easy to orient it yourself. Um, and you can easily convert that from Google Earth and make it, put it into GIS. Um, so, yeah. That is wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, sort of, I think you used both my maps and Google Earth. Would you like to yeah. tell us a little uh, more about? Yeah, we, um, while we work on the ground, so we captured the 3 d frame kind of data or the map points. Uh, for the business map points and the public map points, we use the Google map. Uh, so why we're using Google map is because of the remote mountain area, the digital footprint is very low. So we want to be enhance those digital footprint, putting those informations on the Google public map. Then while we are working with the community, so we are more focused on working with the cities, uh, local municipalities. So they have uh, different uh, uh, public informations, but they want to be put in the like uh, privately. 
So, for example, there is a number of schools, um, the number of students in the schools, kind of information. So that we for that we use my map, and we also do a storytelling. We capture the story in the different uh, locations. Uh, to present the those stories, we use Google Earth because uh, Google Earth became more interactive, more flexible, and uh, the young people really enjoy to look into those um, moment of the map and everything. Also, you can use the street view over there, so it's very exciting to engage the young people for the Thank you, Sarah. Can I add anything uh, to you, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Go um, ahead. The other thing I think about a lot of the Google tools and specifically my map is the ability to collaborate on them. So like multiple people can be using the map at the same time and there just aren't other tools that let that happen. Um, and so that was the other thing. Absolutely. That's a great point. I think yeah. my maps, Google Earth creation tools um, and also Google Earth engine. If you want to share scripts, they're all super collaborative. Um, thank you so much for the really insightful answers, everyone. I'm sure anyone who is just starting out and is trying to decide which tool to use for the project has a lot of um, information to help them decide. Um, great. So our next question is for Sora. I would like to know if the build camp and other mapping projects are for selected cities only. The question is from Imeka Olor. Um, uh, while we choose the city, so it's a it's a open uh, campaign. So we offer any city or the, any young people can come up uh, that we want to be work with us uh, uh, for the story camp and the map up camp. So we train them how to capture the stories, how to put uh, the uh, map points. But for the build camp, obviously it's a process of engaging community, young people with the city um, for the planning process. So city need to be indoors. Uh, for example, if city is not ready to work with us, so we we are not able to do a build camp on that particular locations. So, um, uh, so this is the very tricky process that uh, we try to start working with the young people, but at the end, we need to be collaborative with the cities. Uh, because if cities doesn't want that map or, or is they, if they doesn't um, want the information that we collect from the ground, uh, the whole idea of making a city as a dream city is not possible. So, so I think I make it clear that for the map up and story camp is open. We can do anywhere uh, with anyone, but for the build camp, we need to collaborate with the cities. Thank you, Saurav. And um, if, let's say, anyone wants to bring Build Camp to their cities and um, is able to sort of coordinate with their local city governments, how, would they be able to reach you for that? Yeah, but it's a it's a four process is a interrelated. So we cannot start Build Camp at the beginning. So you have to do uh, start with the map up camp, then story camp, then dream camp, then the Build Camp is the last process. Uh, maybe I don't think on that way. So we can st also start with the build camp, uh, but mm -hmm. that more tricky. <laughs> that we need to be rework on that. I totally, it's a process. So yeah, I think for anyone who wants to do this, definitely, I think sort of stock and slides are a good reference point. Um, great. Our next question is for uh, Nasi Seko. I am from Nepal, working for government as a joint secretary in Ministry of Forests and Environment. I would like to know um, the ownership of the land and how it is being mainstreamed by policy in the government. This question is from Pashupati Koirala. Um, OK, cool. Thank you for the question. Um, so the. The areas that we mapped are rural areas and the land is pretty much it belongs to the government um but traditional leaders have some to say some authority in terms of they can decide what happens in a certain area of the um in the landscape so like divide where households should be fields and that stuff um so yeah uh Communities don't own the land, and 
it, yeah, <laughs> no one is title deeds, except for, um, and then it's different when you get to commercial areas. Uh, commercial farmers still have title deeds and stuff like that, so it's personal. Um, yeah, I don't know, don't know if I answered the question properly. Yeah, I think, I think that was definitely helpful. Um, these are sort of different models. So yeah, I think your talk also has like good um, insights there. Um, thank you, Mr. Seiko. Um, okay, so the next question is for anyone and it's from Anil. I'm gonna try to slightly sort of um, paraphrase this um, as how did you or the community work with the local government to make sure the maps were used for long-term planning and implementation of decisions? Um, and there is a follow-up question where, um, you know, are there any lessons learned for how to work effectively with local governments and decision makers to make sure community maps are taken into account? So does anyone want to take this? Mm, so I, can I can I take this one? Please um, go ahead, Sarah. Because I'm, I'm, I'm really working hard to convince the government people uh, yeah. since a few, <laughs> few years. So yeah. The, um, while we are, uh, uh, many city have their GIS mapping things because they need to do some uh, some land use plan and everything. So many city has their officers, GIS experts on their side. Uh, they have a map points, data and everything. But the interesting thing is they doesn't public that. Uh, GIS map is not public um, uh, for the citizens, right? So if you need um, any specific uh, land land use plan, uh, you can go to uh, take that offer to bring that public. So uh, our idea is why not uh, pop, uh, community people can engage on the mapping so that the understanding of the city is better than better to the uh, young people. So uh, on that process, the government officers are quite uh, excited. Uh, uh, on two perspective. One is uh, it also enhances the digital footprint of those particular locations, uh, especially the locations like ours, which are not um, um, uh, the information are not be updated on the map. So uh, on the pro on this process, the information and the map points will be updated. Uh, that is also benefited to the uh, government. And it also helps to plan uh, for example, if the highway is uh, the new highway is going through the uh, some community, so they need to be expand their uh, city. They need to be plan other infrastructure, so that um, number of businesses will be expanded. So this kind of information all also help us to um, redesign uh, specific locations for the city planning process. That's why the uh, uh, the uh, city is now uh, trying to own those informations for their planning process uh, on my work. Uh, thank you, Saro. I think like my key takeaway from this is that uh, be sure to emphasize on the benefits of doing this for the government because that'll get them sort of excited about this project. Um, Mr. Seiko, you've also worked quite a bit with the government. Um, is yeah. there anything you would want to add from your experience? So um, for us, because we're funded by the national government, um, whatever we produce goes straight to them. And they are they are trying, the different section that we're working with is trying to have some input from the ground. So they were happy to have our maps to put them in their plan. So it wasn't a, a difficult negotiation. Although um, when it comes down to provincial and local government, it's a different um, situation. We are still, with the help of our provincial government, trying to get in touch with the local municipality to show them the tools that we have. And um, because we are from university and we can certainly work um, in a beneficial way with the municipalities, especially the local municipalities. So we're still trying to foster those relationships. So we can also do something that's directly beneficial to them because we are funded by the national government. So it's a, it's not an easy relationship to create with the provincial and local, but we, we're on our way there. Yeah, you're continuing to try. Another big lesson yeah. is do not give up. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> um, but great. Um, we have quite a few more questions. So unless um, Jack or Stephanie, if there's anything you want to add, is that okay if we move on? Yeah, we can move on. Okay, awesome. So um, the next question is um, for anyone. Um, the question, again, it's from uh, Emeka Ulur. Um, how can we employ Google Earth for projects if internet is a challenge, especially when maps are not up to date? What that means if maps are not up to date? Is um, I think they meant that probably if internet is a challenge and if they want to maybe take collect data live. Um, I guess maybe you can focus on like the first part of the question where you know like what are some of the challenges you face due to um, the lack of internet and um, in that case like what do you do to sort of address um, those issues? Um, so uh, uh, on uh, on our work, so we try uh, try to work on the remote part of the country. So definitely, there is uh, the access of internet is real challenges. Uh, but the meantime, what we explore the solution is we develop a small uh, app so that can work offline. Uh, on that app, we call this Studio. Studio. Um, this is a very simple app. Uh, where we can capture the map points. Uh, we can also capture the photo, or, and we can, we can also capture the video. But the, interestingly, when you, when you come back uh, from the ground to the internet ecosystem, so the information, uh, that information will be, uh, you can retrieve to the, uh, to the internet. Uh, so, how we work on on this location is we go to offline so there there is nothing updated uh, live from the ground we collected all the data bring back to the um, to the one one specific locations where you can uh, we, we can have an internet and up, update that information on that uh, uh, from that point and uh, for the google earth we put the information on the google earth even the video, even some of the 360 imagery, and, and we try to make it screen video, capture the record, the screen video, and took it back to the community to showcase how it looks like, seen in the Google Earth. But we are trying to convince the local government to, uh, they need to be work on the accessibility on the internet uh, to the schools and they have to the, uh, war office uh, uh, on their app. So at least for the community peoples, if they cannot use it at homes, so they can use it in the schools and or, on, the, on the public places. So it's not happening right now, but if that could be happen, they can directly access the informations they put in the map uh, by themselves. For now, it's uh, uh, almost 80% we work in offline. Thank you, Saurav. I know you mentioned that internet is something important for Jeep City, so we hope that uh, that happens um, often. Uh, I mean, that happens soon. Uh, uh, any of the other speakers, is there anything you wanted to add here? OK, great. So we can move on to the next question. Um, this is, again, for anyone. Um, the question is for from Anil. I'm going to um, paraphrase this a bit um, as uh, just give me one second. Yes. Um, yeah. How has the pandemic impacted your community mapping projects? What new challenges are there to making sure that community perspectives are included in that? Um, I can start. Um, so when the pandemic first started and, and things started getting locked down, we altered our community mapping tools that we offer um, to educators and youth to you know, add additions where they didn't need to leave their house. So using Google Street View to examine your community from that bird's eye view. Um, and then we also added you know, some social justice components to it, given all of the things going on globally around that. So. I think this has been a big year for us in terms of saying like, you've been stuck at home, but 
but let's broaden your perspective of your community because our our individual communities have become so small being locked in but we're still such a, a component of a larger community and so that's really been one of the lessons we've been putting into our curriculum this year that is such a beautiful lesson it's like you know you from the comfort of your home broaden your horizons and yeah yeah i mean and the cool thing with street view is you can look you can go back in time too and you can see like what did it look like in the fall what is it you know what does it look like from bird's eye view what do i see when i drive around in a car or when i look out my window absolutely um yeah one of my favorite stories of street view is a teacher who wanted to sensitize um young kids to 9/11 and this was like kids who are in school now so they you, they can actually go back and like yeah. see um what it looked like with the site looked like before the uh, new towers are constructed so it's a great tool um yeah this um sort of you uh, know si psycho jack um uh, anything you want to share yeah yes yeah. yeah the connectivity of internet is real challenge for us mm -hmm. uh, after this lockdown but the interestingly we get a lot of invitations from the neighboring cities um after this lockdown and we started uh, doing a session online uh, of the mapping and the storytelling things uh, like uh, some of these cities uh, young people will gather in the zoom uh, or google meet and we train them how to put the uh, local information uh, on the google map uh, how to capture the photo uh, and put it in the map so uh, we are uh, we are able to train ourselves how to train uh, virtually to to the participants right to the young people so that's a very interesting learning for us so we we are planning to do um in number of cities because it's a very uh, uh, resource efficient right uh, if you have to travel to those mountain cities that's very costly but if we are able to do it a session on online through virtual uh, means it's a very cost effective and even uh, it's a more uh, environment friendly your your carbon footprint or you didn't have to invest in the carbon footprint right so yeah. uh, pandemic gives us a very good learning for that but the only one challenge is uh, if they didn't have a good access of the internet the training sessions cannot be run very properly so otherwise we we are able to now we are able to train them uh, partially uh, on mapping and storytelling thanks last one um, after that yeah yeah sorry go ahead uh, go ahead Nancy. Okay, so for us, our bigger project of mapping with the communities was, it happened like 2017, 2018, but we recently had um, like a private company wanting to, not a company, um, another university wanting to come and map out and prioritize um, gullies or um, avoid the degradation in the area. So we have uh, people that we work with on the ground, which live within the villages, and the project. Um, luckily, we had funding to provide them with cell phones that have, um, you know, they can have GPS coordinates and stuff. So what uh, they did was to go to the traditional leaders, explain the purpose of what um, the people that want to come to the community need or want, and then the community, the traditional leader would either go with. Um, the person that we work with into the sites and say, okay, this site here needs um, needs attention, and then our person would use their phone and would activate the GPS location. So take a picture of that area, and automatically um, with your GPS coordinates, when you upload your pictures onto Google Earth, it will go to the site um, that is geolocated on your phone. Um, so that that was the way that we tried to still continue with the prioritization but within the communities because if people have uh, been told to do stuff like the other university then they have to do it whether the community's input is in or not so that's how we managed to include the communities anyway so it included a lot of groundwork from our people but yeah. yeah it was worth it in the end 
Um, but yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, sharing sharing your answers. I know we're um, out of time for today, so um, if there are any pending questions, we really apologize we couldn't get to all of them. But thank you for joining us today. Thank you to all of our speakers for joining us live. Um, I just wanted to share a quick announcement before you leave that um, you know if this session was helpful for you for your current or future projects and if you're inspired to create your own community maps please do share them with us and if you missed the last lightning talk session on earth engine apps you can view it on demand um, on this platform our next month's theme for lightning talks is going to be air quality so we hope to see you again soon and until then please take care and stay safe thank you to all of our speakers thank you for joining thank you goodbye thank you. Bye, everyone Bye. 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 Bye.